appreciate you guys all coming in on time. Um, so one thing that I, I think the timing of this is really good because we're getting into the time where everyone has the reason for why it slows down. Um, and I think of reasons, excuses, anything we tell ourselves as a reason why it's okay that we're not where we want to be. I look at that as an excuse. Um, this whole year has been, well, the market's been so tough. Um, not for everyone, only for the people who say the market's been so tough. The market hasn't been tough for those that don't believe in the market. Um, and that's really, if, if, if nothing else, the one thing I want you to take away and kind of have a mindset shift on today is there isn't really a market for us, right? The market speaks to the masses. So is there enough to go around? Are there enough homes selling to go around? No, absolutely not. Are there enough homes selling for you to make an extraordinarily extraordinary living? Absolutely, right? Um, if you close one transaction a month, and you end up closing two transactions a month, you just doubled your market share. So the way that I look at what I do for a living is I really don't care about the market. I don't care what's happening nationally. I don't care what's happening um, to others. I care about who I can impact and how I can make change. And if there's transactions happening, my only goal is to become part of them. Um, and that's, that's really what I hope for you guys. So what we're going to go through today is kind of what I call the psychology of real estate, um, because that's what this has been. Um, if any of you guys have seen me speak on this stuff before, some of these will be familiar in the beginning, but the whole the, the whole thing is going to be different and geared for Q4 for you. Um, so, you know, we have to think about where people's mindsets are. Um, and by the way, if you have questions uh, or want to jump in, please interrupt me. Uh, when it's Zoom, I can't really see what's going on or what people are thinking. So if you have questions or you think I'm wrong about something, jump in and let's create a conversation. That's really the best people, best way for us to all learn together. Um, so 2021 was the fear of missing out, right? Everyone was buying homes in 2021 because interest rates were low. Uh, everyone said you should. The media, well, the media was the only person saying you shouldn't. They were saying home prices are too high. It's a terrible time to buy. The market's going to crash. Um, but what was social media saying? Everything was saying invest in real estate, invest in real estate, invest in real estate. So if I want to do that, I don't feel like I can lose because everyone else is doing it, right? And you all had clients that said, you know what? This is insane. I'm not willing to pay these prices. I don't want to fight these people for these homes. So we got to 2022. And in 2022, that became the opportunity for those people, right? Hey, good news. You said you didn't want to fight anyone. We can actually get you a discount on the house now. Oh, well, I don't want to buy a house if no one else is buying homes. That's a fear of missing, messing up, right? So 2022 became the fear of making a mistake or messing up. And, and that was it. It's like, wait a sec, 2021, you said you didn't want to buy because everyone else was. And now that no one else is, you still don't want to buy? It doesn't make any sense, but that's a fear, right? I don't want to make a mistake. And that's where it brings us to 2023. 2023 was just, I have no idea what to do or what's going on. It's just, it's been an absolute mess. So you have to think about what the people who are looking to buy or looking to sell are, 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 are seeing, right? Here's a bunch of articles. Interest rates are the highest they've ever been. Uh, 6.37%, home prices are going down. All these different things are fed to us, right? By the media and Diana Olick being the queen of the crash. That's what I call her. These are the articles she was putting out to people. Since 2015, Diana Olick has been telling the world that home prices are going to crash. Home sales fell 6%, mortgage demand falls. Mortgage demand falls, that means home prices should fall, right? Less demand. Uh, mortgage refinancing drops to 22 year low. Interest rates surge even higher. Great, that means I'm gonna get the discount. If rates go up higher, then the home prices are gonna come down. Home prices fell for the first time in three years last month. And it was the biggest decline since 2011. Oh my gosh, biggest decline in 12 years. The moment's coming that I've been waiting for for home prices to go down. She's the queen of the crash. She's been saying it's going to crash since 2015. And these things are important because this is what your clients and your future clients are, you know, I hate the word leads, but anyone you're talking to, this is why we think the way we think because of what we are fed, right? They call it a, a Facebook feed, an Instagram feed. We're being fed information and that's how we have to look at it. Foreclosures. I just Googled California foreclosures. States that saw the greatest number of foreclosure starts in the first half of 2023 and included California, right? Oh my gosh, California is falling apart. What a mess. Everyone's leaving California. Home prices are going to come down. This is what everyone's seeing. And then we have to add social media on top of that. 
You have comments like this one, Morgan Stanley and the rest that believe the housing market is not going to drop way more than 7% is in for a rude awakening. It'll be a 15 to 25% drop before it's all over with. This recession that's going to hit is going to hit a lot harder than most people think. Well, what makes we in position 69 smarter than every analyst at Morgan Stanley? But people will see that comment and they'll buy into it and they'll say, well, shoot, what if we in position 69 is right? I'm going to hold off, right? This fear came in and it's our job in our industry to show people how to get out of that fear and make an educated decision. When I see all the stuff I just showed you guys, I love it. I love it because it gives me things to talk about because I know how to combat those things. I know how to show the truth in what's happening. Um, I'm one of the top mortgage advisors in the country. I've helped uh, 120-ish people buy homes so far this year. Um, the market's moving, right? There's always transactions happening. We just have to be a part of them. And by understanding how to overcome these things is, is how you will do more transactions. Not next year. I'm not worried about next year yet. I want you guys to do more in the fourth quarter, like from here on out, right? Don't wait on this stuff. You can make an impact right now. So um, we're going to talk about the top three reasons to not buy real estate, because that's how everyone's looking at it, right? Inflation, the recession, and mortgage rates, right? Those are the three things. Oh, inflation's going up too fast. A recession's coming, so home prices are going to go down. Mortgage rates are too high. I can't afford, and high rates mean that home prices have to come down. Remember, I don't know if any of you guys heard this, but last year, um, I heard this numerous times. If more for every 1% mortgage rates go up, home values will come down $100,000. On the surface, that makes no sense. So you're telling me if I have a $200,000 home in Nebraska, that if rates go up 1%, it's going to go down 50% in value? Um, and I don't even think that makes sense on a million dollars. Why would a 1% incre increase in rates equate to a 10% change in value. So there was no rhyme or reason for that to be said, but it was said and people bought into it and they waited and they waited for rates to go up so that home prices would come down. So we'll talk about inflation first. Um, this is my grandparents' house uh, right in your guys' neck of the woods, actually. Um, it's worth about $3.2 million right now. They bought it in 1971 for $40,000. And all of us, our clients say, oh my gosh, they were so lucky. How lucky were they to get a house for $40,000? Well, these are the same grandparents that told me a candy bar cost a nickel, right? Remember when candy bars cost a nickel? Well, here's an example of a Butterfinger from 1975, five cents. What does a candy bar cost today? Two bucks? If you bought a whole bunch of Butterfingers back in 1975 and you held on to them, assuming they wouldn't expire, right? You would make a 4,000% return on your investment selling those today. It's the exact same candy bar. Nothing has changed. Maybe there's more chemicals in, in it today, but outside of that, nothing's changed. Um, but the value has gone up dramatically and that's inflation. Inflation is what has driven up the price of this candy bar. Well, it does the same for housing. If you bought a million dollar home in 2018, just by way of inflation, that home would have a, a net cost of a million two thirty. So that's a 25% increase in price as a result of inflation. Um, and you can do this with everything, right? So the reason I use 2018, by the way, is when you're showing comparisons, don't go back too far in history. I keep seeing this thing about where interest rates were in the 80s. It doesn't hold any water because of where home prices were in the 80s. It doesn't mean anything to anyone. And it's too far for these people to remember. Um, if you think of, you know, the, the first time home buyers, who's buying right now, they were probably born in the 80s or 90s, right? So rates back then mean nothing to them because they, they don't know when that was. But I know when 2018 was. I remember 2018. So we can go back to that. And the reason I always reference 2018 is because the fourth quarter of 2018, we had high interest rates. Rates went up into the low fives, I would say. But housing came to a halt. People were doing price reductions. Homes were sitting on the market. And everyone said it was a terrible time to buy real estate, right? Oh, home prices are going down because rates are too high. Well, what happened after that, right? Um, don't count 2020, 2021 so much maybe, but home prices have gone up since. People that bought in 2018, refinanced in 2019, and then they refinanced again in 2020 and in 2021. So what's important here to remember with inflation, when you're talking to your clients about how inflation impacts real estate is what's the target number for the Fed? 
the Federal Reserve wants inflation to get down to 2% before they will start to cut rates. And they're really sticking to that number, even though they shouldn't, but they're sticking to it. Well, 2% is not a negative number, right? 2% over five years is an increase of 10% in cost. That means home values by way of inflation, my dollar does not buy me what it used to. And what does a mortgage do for you? I got my house in 2021. My interest rate's 2.625. Rates have gone up and up and up. Inflation's gone up and up. The dollar's worth less. My monthly payment's exactly the same as it was back then. And it will be for the next 28 years. A mortgage protects you from inflation. And inflation drives your home value higher. It's the number one driver of appreciation over time. And people have forgotten that because we are told by the media, by social media, the opposite. Does anyone have questions? You can always, if you don't want to be uh, like, you don't want to speak, you can just go chat. Uh, if you want to type into the chat, that's fine. Or we can make this conversational. All right, hey, cool. Sean, Let's keep rolling. Sean, yes, sir. A question for you. Uh, you this chart shows the, the uh, inflation rate versus uh, home value. Would you have a chart like this that reflects, uh, uh, you know, average um, uh, interest rate versus how the prices move? I'm sure it exists. Um, I don't, we'll get to that in rates. I don't really think it's relevant anymore because of what this market has been. So historically, we could look at that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's value in that right now. I'm sure it exists. I just don't have a uh, have it. I just saw something this weekend where they were talking about the 80s, which I just said not to do, but they were talking about how much rates had gone up, but home prices had been going up as well. So you know, it's, it's, I guess if we wanted to use some data like that, that's older, it'd just be history repeating itself. Um, but I really wanted to, with this specific piece, just to show um, how inflation is increasing value because people think think it, the opposite has happened. Any other questions before I move on? All right, cool. All right, so let's talk about the recession. So I'm gonna play a quick video. I watched the big short a couple weeks ago and this video was in there. Tell me if the audio, whoops, what happened here? There we go. Tell me if you can hear the audio here. Oh, Robbie in a bubble bath, I'll explain. Basically, Lewis Rainier's mortgage bonds were amazingly profitable to the big bank. They made billions and billions on their 2% fee. They got the selling each of these bonds, but then they started running out of mortgages put in them. After all, there are only so many homes and so many people with enough jobs to buy them, right? So the banks started filling these bonds with riskier and riskier mortgages. That way, they can keep that profit machine turning, right? By the way, these risky mortgages are called subprime. So whenever you hear subprime, think yes. All right. So subprime loans. So mortgage bonds still exist, right? And everyone thinks of a recession dropping home prices because of what happened in 2008. But what type of loans don't really exist anymore? Subprime, right? What was a subprime loan? Low credit score, uh, no money down, um, maybe adjustable rates, prepayment penalties, things like that, right? Those types of loans don't really exist anymore. But what's interesting to me... Let me go. Hold on. Go Robbie in a bubble. How do I get past this freaking slide? Go Robbie. There. Okay. So this is mortgage bonds trading. This is a chart of mortgage bonds. This is what I follow every single day uh, to make sure I get my clients the best interest rates available. Um, these loans are still traded, right? So a mortgage bond or mortgage-backed security are loans that are pooled and sold and invested in on the um, secondary market. Um, they exist today, just like they did in 2008. What's missing from them is risk. Everything is full, uh, has full documentation, income assets, credit verified, probably a, a great credit score for the most part, um, has money down, there's skin in the game. Uh, a friend of mine was a mortgage bond trader and he went out of business because there was no margin in trading these anymore because there was no risk. So when we're talking about what mortgage bonds are doing, this is what we're talking about. And one thing that comes up for me, and this may not be as, as popular for you all in Silicon Valley, but the California Dream for All program, that's a subprime loan, right? Low credit score, no money down. Uh, you have to give up equity to get out of it. 
that is a subprime loan. And that's what everyone wants to come back, right? That loan was so popular. Everyone wanted to talk about it. And we don't realize what we're actually asking for. So just something to think about. I thought that was interesting. Any questions before I move on? All right, cool. I'm going to keep rolling. So if you do have a question, just interrupt me, please. So, um, you know, when will rates go down? This was a comment uh, that we got. So when will rates go down? Please stop giving advice. This is how people buy homes and lose them in a recession. We only think of a recession as 2008. Because again, you have to think of what people know. So I'm 42 years old. The only recession I've personally experienced and been through was 2008. But if I look at the, all the recessions in history, which this is a, a goes back to 1965, these gray lines are all recessions. What did home values do? Home values were flat through the recession in 1970. They increased in 1975. They went up slightly in 80. They were modestly flat to a slight increase around 83. Flat in 90. Um, bumped up right after the 03 one. That was the first tech boom crash. 08, dramatic decrease. The only time that we've seen home values decrease as a result of a recession was 2008. And that's because of what was described in that video we just played from uh, the big short. So we have to educate people that home values in a recession actually increase and they increase because mortgage rates come down. So not if, but when we get into this recession, I think we're already in it. They're just trying to pretend we're not. Um, as we get deeper into the current recession, you're going to see the Fed start to cut rates. Um, and when that happens, what's gonna happen to home buyers? You're gonna have more and more flood in the market because the demand can increase because it's easier to qualify when interest rates go down. Recessions drive home values up, not down. Um, when I show clients, so I'm kind of getting into some things I show clients. So when I show clients what's going on, I have this same kind of conversation with buyers who are a little timid about what they should do, which is a lot of them. Um, I use Redfin data to show. Redfin's uh, market trends, are I, I really like it. Love or hate Redfin, their, their data is pretty good. So I pulled up Martinez for a client the other day and I threw this in here. Um, home values in Martinez have gone up almost 12% in the last 12 months, which is staggering, right? Wait a sec, rates are in the sevens. I thought home values were supposed to go down. Well, they're, they've gone up 12% in Martinez. And what's really interesting that caught my eye here is look at the number of homes sold is up 31%. When this number is a positive and this number is a positive, this means this city is getting into more demand. Right. That was really interesting. I did the same thing for Livermore, 16 percent increase year over year, but we have no homes for sale. So this makes sense. Having a 16 percent increase, prices going up when there's less supply makes a lot of sense. Foreclosures. This is what everyone's waiting for. Right. All these big foreclosures to hit. States that saw the greatest number of foreclosure starts in the first half of 2023 included California, 14,217 foreclosure starts. Is 14,000 a lot in California? Pretty small number, right? And most people don't read that far. They just stop here when they see, they get to California, they stop. Okay, cool. California's falling apart. I knew it. Well, let's look at what foreclosures have done since 2008. We peaked out in 2010. Every year since then, they've consistently been coming down until you get to 2022. In 2022, foreclosures more than doubled compared to 2021. And that's what they were telling people last year. Scary. Oh, wait, there was a foreclosure moratorium in 2020 and 2021. They weren't allowed to foreclose on people in 2021 or, or 2020. So it makes sense that it's gone up. But look at the numbers. We're still, you know, close to half of what we were in 2019. And the increase from 22 to 23 is only up 14,000. People don't have to foreclose right? They have equity. That's the big difference. The mortgages made in 2008 meant that your loan balance increased, right? The payment, your monthly payment did not cover the interest due. So the difference in interest was tacked on your loan balance. So if you put zero down on a million dollar home and you have a million dollar mortgage and the first month, there's a thousand dollars of unpaid interest because of the loan program you chose. Now your loan balance is a million, 1,000. Next month, a million, 2,000, a million, 3,000. Oh, now home values went down to 900. I'm 100,000 underwater, I'm out. I'm just gonna give my keys back. That's what causes foreclosures is a lack of equity. If I have equity in my home and the average home in America, the average financed home in America has over 40% equity, I'm just gonna call you guys to help me sell it, right? 
hey, I'm getting divorced. I lost my job. I fell on hard times. Something bad happened. Can't afford my house anymore, unfortunately. I don't have to give the keys back to the bank. I just have to call a real estate professional and sell it on the normal market and probably get more than I need. But it's not hard to break even, so no one's foreclosing anymore. It's an important thing to think about and tell people. All right, so Diane Ola, queen of the crash. Remember, everything she's ever put out is the market is going to crash. Look at what she's saying now. Home prices are hitting new highs again as high rates push the squeeze on supply, July 10th of this year. August 4th of this year, here's how much cash you may have in your home thanks to new record high prices. When she started talking about this, that is a big deal. When someone who since 2015 has been saying the market's going to crash, the market's going to crash, the market's going to crash, now comes out and is saying, look at how much value you have because home prices keep going up. She did another article where she said home values nationally have gone up 0.7% month over month for the last four months. That would be a 2.8% increase in value nationally. We all know what the Bay Area market is, right? We always beat national averages. And I just showed that in Livermore and Martinez. The fact that Diana Olick is talking about how much money people have is crazy. And this is what's so important for people like this. He's completely wrong, right? I forget when this, this, are, this was, uh, I think I did this video last year, um, hypothetically saying, what if rates went to 8%? Um, and this is, this is one of the comments, right? People that talk like this, they want, they're jealous, right? There's something in them that thinks they'll never be able to have it. And the reason I love using social media so much is I get to get a glimpse of what people are thinking because they'll emotionally type it, right? And then I can speak to that. So getting, posting on social media and getting comments like this doesn't mean I think this guy's an idiot. It gives me an opportunity to educate, right? He thinks this way. I promise you other people do as well. Just gives me an opportunity to educate. All right, so mortgage rates. Um, any questions on the recession stuff before I move on? All right, cool. Just checking the chat. Nothing there. All right, so mortgage rates. It's what we're all waiting on, right? What's going on with rates? Why do they keep going up? When are they going to come down? I really don't care about mortgage rates. And you guys shouldn't either. And the reason for that is you cannot change them and you cannot control them. So if we agree that home prices right now are going up every single month, why do we care about interest rates? Why do we want to talk to our clients and educate them on, look, you know what? I think rates are going to go down at the end of 2024. Um, maybe wait till 2024. I talked to somebody uh, in an office meeting like this one time in person. I said, what are you guys hearing from your clients? Like the only way I can help you is if I understand what you're hearing because you guys hear it before I do. And she's like, well, all my clients are just waiting for rates to go down. <laughs> Excuse me. And I said, why? She goes, what do you mean? I'm like, did you ask them why they're waiting for rates to go down? She's like, well, no. I'm like, why not? She's like, well, it's obvious. I'm like, what's well, obvious about it? I'm just curious. Like, why, why wouldn't you ask what, what they wanted? How do I help them if I don't know what they want? And she said, because is, if rates go down, um, the home becomes more affordable. I go, but what else happens when rates go down? Well, home values go up. Right. Well, what if we could get the lower interest rate using a temporary rate buy down program like the 21321, those types of things? What if we could get them the rate they want right now? What if we could get them a seller credit to do a permanent rate buy down and help them qualify for more house? If you guys aren't asking your clients why they're waiting and not taking it into a deeper conversation, I don't look at it as you're not making money. I look at it as we're doing a disservice to the home buyer because they will pay higher prices. And what do we know about interest rates? As they come down, we can all refinance. So I don't care where interest rates are today. What I care about is, can you afford the monthly payment? For now, you know, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable, um, is it worth the stretch for this property? If it is, buy the house because we know that you're going to get into your comfort zone as mortgage rates fall. This is another interesting comparison you can make. I bought my house in 2021. I had to fight 20 people for it. I paid 200,000 more than I wanted to. Um, my monthly payment is based on an interest rate of 2.625, and my monthly payment is higher than my comfort zone was back then. It's still uncomfortable. Of course, I would love it to be lower. But will I ever have an opportunity to refinance? No, rates will never go that low again. If somebody buys today at 7%, will rates go lower? Will we see six and a half? Will we see six? Will we see five? Yeah, absolutely. The people who are buying above and beyond their comfort zone today, and I'm not encouraging it, but I'm saying we can all, we all have stretch goals. You're going to get into your comfort zone. And as rates come down, home values are going to go up even faster. So we have to remind people of this and not do videos like this. 
Um, I don't know if you all remember this going viral back. Actually, I don't even remember what month this was. Earlier this year, and everyone was saying paying 7% interest at 30,000 under asking price is better than paying 3% interest, 100,000 over asking. That absolutely, I already know that doesn't make sense as a lender. So why are realtors telling people that, right? So I made a video to combat that. And you all can do the same thing. The value of social media, the, the reason we all use social media, and if you're not, you should be, is to build community and show people that can know you, like you, and trust you. That's all we want. People work with people that they know, like, and trust. That's who we want to be. And comments like this give us the opportunity to speak to it. I'll show you. If only more people understood this. Hello, Ms. Lady. I'm going to have to go ahead and sort of disagree with you there. All right, I think this needs a little clarification because I don't understand what's better about it. So let's go through it together. And I'll show you at the end what I think she meant. Because what I did here is I took a price of $500,000, increased it by $100,000 at 3% to $600,000, and then decreased it by $30,000 to four seventy. dollars So if you bought a house for $600,000, $100,000 over asking, at a rate of 3%, your mortgage taxes and insurance would be $2,748. Well, if you waited and bought it now, as she's suggesting, saying it's better, it would be four hundred seventy thousand at a rate of seven percent. Means your payment's thirty thousand ninety one dollars. That's three hundred forty two dollars more per month. If she meant savings over time, you're still going to save more money at lower interest. You save sixty thousand dollars in just the first five years between your principal pay down. So you pay down more principal at the lower interest rate. You're paying less interest. Your tax benefit, all things considered, you save more money at a lower rate. Here's what I think she meant. You buy a house right now while no one's looking, you get the house at a discount, then you refinance to a lower rate later. Fannie Mae's predicting 4.5% next year. At a rate of 4.5%, using the buy now with a discount on the house strategy, your monthly payment will be about $120 less than if you had bought back then at 3%. So that's exactly what I just described. Buy the house now. You might be a little out of your comfort zone on payment, but it will come down. In this example, very small loan amount, right? $120 savings that can move the needle for a lot of people. And I think it's our responsibility and our duty to educate people on this. Now, do I think you guys should speak to interest rates? I don't, um, but your mortgage advisor be the expert on that side of it. I don't speak to square footage. I don't speak to aesthetics. I don't speak to comparable sales. It's not my area of expertise. This is my area of expertise. And that's why I really believe the lender realtor partnership is more important now than it's ever been. There we go. So I'm going to skip this one. So here's a chart of mortgage bonds. So that, that last video, I basically was saying, again, realtors talking about, um, actually, you know what? Let's just play. It's a little crude, but I'm going to play it anyways because I put it on the internet. Um, what the fuck is going on? Oh, what's up, Channing? Dude, I just can't figure out how to start this rate update video. So we have something really, really important to tell you about. No, that shit won't work. They never pay attention to me say that. The problem is that they think rates got better because inflation went down, when the reality is we're stuck on this ceiling. Check this out. We keep hitting this ceiling right here, and I can't figure out how to get them to understand that rates won't get better until we break through it. We want to burst through our ceiling. And then what do we do about these ceilings? We just got to keep hammering steel. That's it? So... Is that a professional video? No, right? There's poor language in it. There's, uh, it's just, but it's funny. And people liked it and shared it. I actually got a deal out of that video. Um, and that's the purpose, right? I felt compelled to do a marketing piece. I did it. And I'm sure there was a lot of people that were like, I don't like this guy. That's fine. Then I'm not your lender. I'm not the right person for you. But this was an easy, simple way for me to show people how we have to break through. And the follow-up to that is, why does it keep doing that? This. So I illustrated these ceilings. This is uh, September. I mean, we're down here. We're back down to these levels again that right now. Well, let's just use that as an example. So I have to get through this ceiling and then through this ceiling. And then this line, this red line is the 25-day moving average. We've got to break through that. Then I have to break through here and here and here. We are so far away from getting the rates that everybody wants that it's not worth waiting for. And again, when rates go down, you refinance. Let everyone else drive home values higher to make you more money in real estate while you lower your monthly payments. That will happen for just about every home buyer. The ones that it won't happen for, if you miss a payment, you mess up your credit, something changes, 
you move out of the property, it becomes an investment property, things like that. But the large majority of people are absolutely going to have opportunities to refinance numerous times over the course of the next two to five years. So we all know that you can't have low interest rates and high, and high home prices. I'm sorry, you can't have low interest rates and low prices at the same time. What we what I would normally say is you can't have high home prices and high interest rates either. This year, we've proven that wrong. Um, and interest rates right now aren't necessarily high. They're just normal, right? We're back to normal. But everyone forgot what normal was because of 2020 and 2021. That became normal because it was there for so long. So think about that. If right now we're seeing sixes and sevens, that is becoming normal for people. So if I get a loan at seven and then I get to, I hear 6.5, Oh my gosh, that's a, a six, not a seven. That's going to get me excited to buy a house. Imagine when it gets to five, imagine when it gets to four. I would say by 2025, the transactions, the people who are still in the business will be doing, you, you, it'll make 2021 look like a joke. The amount of home price increases and demand you're going to see are going to be absolutely insane with interest rates in the fours and fives instead of the twos and threes. And that's Purely because we're seeing home values go up at the same prices at the same rate as uh, as or geez I can't talk as home as rates are going up it's all happening at once. So the truth of the matter is the top three reasons to not buy real estate are actually the top three reasons to buy real estate, right? Inflation drives home values up, recessions drive home values up, and the current rates are not having an impact. We're still seeing home values go up even with current interest rates, and as they come down, values are going to go up even more. It's purely supply and demand. So let's talk about reasons people don't get their offers accepted, right? Again, we're sticking to the psychology here. Um, it's an emotional decision buying a house. I think we can all agree on that. But what happens, most of the lenders that your clients may work with are order takers, right? They don't, they're not there to give advice and guidance. They're just giving people what they ask for. And I had a recent experience with this when somebody was referred to me by three of my past clients who didn't know each other, three separate people said, you need to call this guy, Sean because the experience they were having with their lender didn't make sense. The rate was going up, the costs were going up every single day. And he got a second opinion outside of me. And then he finally called me and said, Sean, three separate people have told me to call you. How can you help me with this? So this is an example. This is what I call a buyer's guide. I build these for every single client I work with because visually seeing the numbers helps them to make better decisions. And I can illustrate anything they wanna see. So he was buying a home for $815,000, putting 5% down, that put his loan amount at 733,000. He was quoted a rate of 7.875. And in that, <clears throat> the, in the cash to close, it was about $5,600 in points to the lender. So he's paying $5,600 for this interest rate of 7.875. He got a second opinion. That person gave him a rate of 7.75, an eighth lower, but said he had to put 10% down to get it. Well, I looked at both of those options and I said, you know what? I'm going to get you a rate that's three eighths lower and you're not going to have discount points. You're going to have the exact same cost as you did with the first lender you spoke with. You said you want to put 5% down. You wanted a lower rate. You wanted lower lower costs. I figured out a way to do that for you. And by the way, either of these other lenders could have done the exact same thing. I said, your loan amount is only $6,000 over the national loan limit. If your loan amount's at 726 or lower, which just bumped to 750, by the way, for next year, but if you're below 726,000, uh, you're going to get a lower rate. I'm just taking the points you were paying anyways Instead of giving the money to the lender, I want you to give it to the equity of your home. I got you the lower rate and these guys could have done the same thing. And he goes, but why didn't they? And I said, because they're order takers. You said you wanted to buy an $815,000 home with 5% down, so they gave you what you wanted. Lender B, you went to them and said you wanted a lower rate, so he showed you a lower rate, which is what you wanted, but he told you you had to put more money down. I listened and found the best solution to get you the lower monthly payment, less fees, and the exact same cash to close you would have had with 5% down. I won, we closed this deal in eight days. It was easy, it was two weeks into his escrow and we were done eight days later, we actually closed early. Um, the lender's the biggest variable in the transaction. Every time I call the listing agent to advocate for my client's offer, I start by saying, I know the lender's the biggest variable in the transaction, I wanna make sure you have complete confidence in our offer. You, you have to control the lender, you have to control the biggest variable. I think it's more critical, like I said earlier, than it's ever been. So let's talk about renting versus owning. That's another one, right? There's a lot of first-time home buyers or renters that could become first-time buyers in Santa Clara County. 
So what I did here is modeled out somebody renting for $3,000 a month with $50 of renter's insurance. They're going to buy a $600,000 home with 10% down. Their monthly payment, mortgage taxes, insurance, and mortgage insurance included, will be $3,911. But they have a tax benefit of $340 per month from the state of California by writing off their mortgage interest and their property taxes. And then they're also paying themselves principal into the equity of their home, right? They're paying down their loan balance every month. So when we net out those benefits, the four savings account of equity and the tax benefit, so they can put more money into their paycheck, you're actually better off owning than renting in that situation. And the most compelling thing I show to people is this slide here. In the next three years, if you rent, you will have spent $116,000 on rent. If you buy, you would have spent $140,000 on your total payment, but you had a $21,000 benefit to the equity of your home. Your loan balance is $20,000 lower. You have $20,000 more equity and you saved $12,000 in taxes. That means your net cost was $106,000. You saved $10,000 over your rent. And by the way, you with just 5% appreciation, and watch what appreciation is doing in Santa Clara County in just a second, uh, you have $156,000 in equity. We can use that equity to buy an investment property. You could sell this property and use that to buy a bigger property. You have lots of options. When people see this, they don't say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that if I buy right now in just three years, I'll have $150,000 I didn't have before. Human nature is negative. They say, oh my gosh, I can't believe if I'd made this decision three years ago, I would have $150,000. Everything's always hindsight. Everybody wishes they bought a home in 2018 when they were told not to buy a home in 2018. Everybody wishes they bought a home in 2020 or 2021. <clears throat> hindsight wins. So when people see this, they don't look forward, they look backwards. And that's the most compelling thing they can do. So I don't want to overpay. Have you all heard this, right? I think this is common. It's the biggest fear we all have. I had that fear in 2021. We have to talk about why home prices are going up with high interest rates. And it's simply supply and demand. So this is a real estate report card for Santa Clara County. I can create these for any county you want, any city you want. Um, a lot of times when I pull the city data, it mirrors the county. Um, but again, this is available. So in Santa Clara County, in the next 12 months, it's forecasted that home prices will go up almost 9%. And over the course of the next five years, they should go up almost 40%. Why? Why would that be? Well, that's because 198,000 people can afford to buy. And they're only building 5,000 homes a year. Can't squeeze 198,000 people into 5,000 homes. And the average age of a first-time home buyer is 27 to 35. And you have 324,000 of them. This is why home prices continue to go up. And when I show this to clients, every client gets one of these when we go through our Zoom together to help them understand how they can make a more confident offer. Uh, they go, well, where's that data coming from? It's coming from Barry Habib. Um, if you don't know who Barry Habib is, he's worth a Google. He is the only real estate economist uh, who has won Zillow's Crystal Ball Award. They give it an award for predicting the future. He's the only person that's won it more than once, and he's won it three times. And he's my really good friend and mentor. Um, I'm so grateful to have this guy in my life, but that's where that data comes from. And that's why I trust it so much. The guy that is the best at predicting the future is who provides that data. He's also the one that gives me the mortgage bonds trading and taught me how to read those. All right, so offer price. So if we've gotten people to understand that home values are going up and there's gonna be multiple offers because there's simply not enough homes for all the people that wanna buy homes, we have to look at what should we offer. This is something I build out for every open house I work on, for every listing that I work on. Um, for the first weekend of open houses, assuming you're telling me, Sean, we're going to get a ton of traffic. We want to see what it looks like. So what I did here is I modeled out a $700,000 home. If there was a $25,000 increase in price, then a $50,000 increase in price. <clears throat> if you ask the client, is it worth paying an extra $25,000 on this property? They might say no. Say no, this thing's not worth an extra twenty-five dollars Let the other suckers pay that. All right, great. Is it worth losing the house over $170 a month? No, that's, that's like one dinner out. No, absolutely not. Is it worth losing over $2,500 a month, right? In this example, I did 10% down. So if we increase price by 25,000, 10% is 2,500. So is the house worth losing over 25,000? Yes, we're moving on. Cool. Is it worth losing over $2,500 out of pocket and $177 a month? No, not at all. We love the house. It's the same question. I'm just finding a better way to ask it. It's not what the house costs, it's what the house costs you that matters. So going up 25,000 means that I have $177 increase in my monthly payment. If I go up 50,000, it's $355. It doesn't matter, I could do a $2 million price and I'll show 2,050. 
the, the difference is the difference. It's the same number. But this, when people see this, it makes it so much easier for them to either offer, make a better offer, right? They're going to go higher in price because they understand what they're paying. Um, or if we get into, you know, uh, a multiple counter, it, they make the most confident offer. We respond the fastest. Confidence gets offers accepted. We've beaten out higher priced offers because we can reply quicker with more confidence. And this is the kind of things that your clients need to be doing to make sure that they win homes. I don't want someone to miss out. I don't want somebody to make another offer, right? Every offer is most likely gonna be more expensive than the last house. If there's 20 people that wanna buy this house and one of them gets it, 19 people, if they liked this one, they're gonna like the next one. 19 people are gonna go fight over the next house. I don't want them to keep paying more and more and more. I don't know if interest rates are gonna go up more and more and more. If I can help them win this house today, that's what I wanna do. And that also helps you make more money faster and show less homes. And the only way to do that is by giving them confidence, not show, telling them how things work, but showing them and letting them make the most educated decision. Um, this was another one I did. It was an offer we made. Client was uh, set at offering a million two twenty. The agent said, Sean, we can win if we get a million two, 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 seven. The client was stuck at this million two twenty. So I called her, I modeled this out for her and I said, okay, I, I get million two twenty is the top number. Um, if you did go to the 227 that the seller is looking for, it would cost you $50 more per month. Done. Offer accepted. But immediately, a million 220 was the number. I'm not going higher. Seven grand more is seven too much. Is 50 bucks a month too much? No. Okay, cool. We'll take it. And by the way, their cash out of pocket was effectively the same because they were putting more down than they needed to anyway. So we kept that number the same. So all this cost was 50 bucks a month and they got their offer accepted. It's not what the house costs that matters. It's what the house costs you that matters. And that's what I tell all of my clients. I want to make sure that they have complete confidence in their offer and in their price. We want to get the money out of the way. We don't want the money to be a variable. And that helps you get offers accepted faster. Then we get to the what if it doesn't appraise conversation. Um, depending on the loan program and depending on the price of the property, sometimes I don't care. If a home is a, a million dollar home, appraises 15% low, they don't have to come in with $1 more. And the reason for that is because the opposite of down payment is loan to value. When your clients tell me that they want to buy a home with 20% down, what I hear is a lender is 80% loan to value. If you're putting 20% down on a million, um, you can have as high of an, as a 95% loan to value. So what would happen if they didn't increase their down payment to make up the difference? If it appraised 10% low, it would be $46 more per month because we simply add mortgage insurance to it. If it appraised 15% low, which is ridiculously unlikely, I've never had that happen, it's $140 more per month. So again, we've overcome all the objections. The client's concerned, well, shoot, I don't know if I have enough money. If, you know, my, my agent was telling me about an appraisal gap and what, what if I don't have the money? You don't need to have the money. Why not? Because you can have a higher loan to value. And by the way, we don't have appraisal issues because we use the best local appraisers. I, I don't. And... We all act like the appraisal is some magical box that we don't understand. Um, you guys have access to MLS. I have access to the internet. I don't have MLS, but I have Redfin. The data that appraisers use is not like in some black mystery box we can't see. You guys see it. You know if the home's going to appraise or not, right? I had a, a, a client get their offer accepted. I need the listing agent really well. And she's like, Sean, I'm just really nervous. It's not going to appraise. This was a VA loan, by the way. I go, okay, why, why are you nervous? She's like, well, there's no comps to support our price. I go, well, I'm not nervous at all. And she's like, why not? I'm like, because I know it's not going to appraise. If there are absolutely no comps that come even close to our price, we're not going to appraise. But let's just get the appraisal in and we'll adjust. He was putting money down, so it didn't make a difference exactly as I'm illustrating here. Um, but it's not, it's not a mystery. I understand it can be if you're using lenders that use bad appraisers. That's a whole different story. I experienced that firsthand when I tried to do a refinance. So I get where that is, but I just don't have those problems. But again, when I'm educating the client, your loan to value may be able to go higher than your down payment, which means you may not have to make up the difference at all. And by showing them that, they make a more confident offer. Confident buyers simply make confident offers. You have to create that confidence. A pre-approval is just not good enough. So that being said, kind of getting towards the end here. And I, this is the thing I hate about Zoom is I can't like see what you guys are feeling if you're if you're all fired up about this or not. But if you agree with everything I've presented to you today, you need to be the loudest person in your market about it as fast as possible, because that is 
that's what makes us part of those transactions. There will be home selling today, tomorrow, all the way through December. There will always be home selling. It's up to us to choose to be a part of that transaction. And that's what I want for you guys. I want to make sure that you can take what you've learned today and be the loudest person in your market, be it through video, be it through social media, mailers. I have this in this killer uh, farming technique that I came up with that's working so well using traditional mail on postcards and then a digital follow-up. It's awesome. Um, I have another thing that I have my agents do. They go back to their previous clients and they do a, a CMA, which we all think no one cares about CMAs, but the way you do it, at once she got uh, three new listings in a four week period and it cost her zero dollars just by doing this follow-up. So there are transactions happening and we can create them if we can create confidence. Um, that's really all I had for you guys. Um, we can jump into questions if you guys want to talk about anything. If there's anything I didn't cover that you have questions about, I'm happy to answer that as well. Uh, just let me know where you want to start. Hey, Sean, uh, would it be possible to get a recording of your presentation? Yes, your office recorded it. And actually, can I get a copy of the recording, please? <laughs> Anyone else? Was this helpful? I mean, thumbs up if you don't want to talk or be seen. Um, like, give me a thumbs up if, it, if you thought this was beneficial. Like, did you see any value in this? If you think uh, I'm wrong, I would love to have that conversation as well because that's how we all learn and grow is by by having conversations about that. So what, what else do you guys want to talk about? If nothing, we can wrap up. Thank you, Sean. That was uh, very informative. And I, I think in the in the Bay Area, our clientele are all data driven, and the way you explain uh, how how the inflation and interest rates impact the decisions, I think uh, would go a long way towards uh, educating our clients. No, I appreciate that, and that's why. So I've only been originating mortgages since 2017, um, and I was one of the top one percent in the country my first year, and it was really because of my data driven approach. I only worked really in Silicon Valley. Like every client I had was an engineer and it's because they loved that approach. Um, you know, now I think more people are, are open to it after COVID and everything else. People want to make more data-driven decisions. Um, and one thing I'll leave you with from a marketing perspective, because I didn't, I, you know, I gave you all the data, but we haven't really talked too much about marketing. I'm happy to have those conversations one-on-one uh, -on -one if you want to. There's a book by Seth Godin called This Is Marketing. And there's a line in there that he's, and this is probably the line he's known most for, um, but he says, people like us do things like this. And it took me forever to understand what that meant. And it made me realize that my marketing cannot be a big net. My marketing is very specific to, to, very, to certain people. So if I want to market to engineers, uh, Surendra, to your point, they're data-driven people. So people like that want things like this. So everything I do would have to be built to serve that audience. If I want to work with police officers, um, I have a landing page specific to law enforcement and the background of the landing page is like the thin blue line, right? So when they go to that landing page, this guy gets me. People like us want things like that. People like us do things like this. Um, that's that's how we need to be marketing. We need to be speaking to what people want to know about uh, on the postcard piece. Halloween's coming up. If you send a postcard that just is happy Halloween, do they look at it? Maybe. But what if you sent one that explained to them how they could buy before they could sell? What if they felt trapped in their home and your postcard spoke to, are you feeling trapped in your home? We all know how people are thinking and feeling. And a lot of times we're scared to ask questions. If you start to market very specifically to these things, you'll get more business faster. This don't be specific, uh, keep the topic broad. I don't just, I, I, I disagree with that. I think we need to be as specific as possible in our marketing efforts. So people like us do things like this. If you embrace that in your marketing, everything changes, everything. All right, you guys. Well, I'm going to get back to it. Uh, if I can help in any way, reach out to me anytime. You can follow me on Instagram at Adventure Lender. Uh, if you didn't scan this QR code already, you can, and we can set up a meeting together uh, just to brainstorm, figure out what you want to do. Again, I don't care about 2024 yet. There's still money to be made in 2023, and I want you guys to be a part of that. 
So let me know I can help. <clears throat> Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate all your time today. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Shin. It's really Thank helpful. You. Yep. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.